Soon I will be on. There I am. Okay. All right. Uh, well, as is our custom at the uh, 1045 service when we have it, and this is a blended service today, um, we take a little bit of time to gather together to have uh, a song or two that accomplishes that purpose and uh, helps us to begin to center and to uh, focus on the Lord. And so uh, I want to invite you to open up your bulletins and join us in singing a couple of these songs, starting with Come Let Us Worship and Bow Down. Come let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our Maker. Come let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our Maker, for He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture, and the sheep of His hand, just the sheep. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our Maker. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our Maker. For He is our the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand, just the sheep of sheep of his hand. My life is in you, Lord, my strength is in you, Lord, my hope is in you. This is the day that the Lord has made. And welcome to worship this sixth Sunday after Pentecost. That's a little hard for me to say, sixth Sunday after Pentecost. Anyway, I got it out. Um, there's a friendship pad in a pew near the center aisle uh, that you are sitting in. Please take that out if you're near that. Beautify it with your name and pass it on down. We appreciate that, and uh, that's a blessing to us, and it will be a blessing to you as well to know that uh, you are registered here and uh, that your presence is acknowledged. This last week, I attended the biennial convention of the American Association of Lutheran Churches. 
This was held in um, Plymouth, up in the cities, at the Free Lutheran Bible College and Seminary. It was a great convention. Uh, the theme of the convention was Reconciled in Christ, a wonderful theme. And there were many great reports. There are many encouraging signs of health and growth in our association, particularly in the growth and health and quality of our seminary, which is known as the American Lutheran Theological Seminary. Um, I remember back in 2013 when we had only about 15 students in the seminary, only three Masters of Divinity candidates. That's the, the degree that you get when you want to become a pastor. I think we had three at that time. And in that particular retreat, Dr. Curtis Lyons challenged us to pray for 50 students, 50 students. And I know that some of us thought, wow, that's a pretty tall order. But now we have 35 men training for pastoral ministry, a total of 54 students in all of the programs unofficially, but really the number is more like 75. And so God has answered our prayers beyond all expectation, and we're still growing. And we're growing with quality. We have solid students who are unconditionally committed to the inerrancy of Scripture and the Lutheran confessions. And as the seminary goes, this is why this is so important, as the seminary goes, so goes the churches. And so praise God, and not least, praise God for the strong leadership in our association of the Reverend Dr. Kerry Larson, our presiding pastor, who I think one or two of you know, might have a personal friendship with him. Uh, he's been doing a great job. Uh, tomorrow night, Monday night, we have Bibles and Brew at the Ward House Brewery, 7 o'clock. All of you are welcome, both men and women, to that event. And so please uh, want to see a lot of you there. Also, along the lines of Bible study, we're starting a new series in our Thursday morning women's Bible study. And uh, this will blow your mind. We are going to be studying the book that everybody fears, that everybody stays away from in the Bible. What is it? Leviticus, that's right. And you wonder, how in the world are you going to attract people to that, you know? That's where everybody stops when they're trying to read through all the Scripture. Well, i got to tell you that the last time I taught Leviticus was about 10 years ago at my former church, and it was the best attended adult Sunday school class that we ever had there in the time that I was at that church. People started coming who had never come to Sunday school before. That's how popular it was, and I guarantee you it's not going to be boring. We are going to get through the book of Leviticus, and you're going to like it. <laughs> so, um, women, come on out for that. I wish we could do it for the men, too. Um, next week, we celebrate Holy Communion. We welcome all to the table who are baptized and instructed in the Christian faith, all who confess their sins, and all who recognize the true body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in, with, and under the forms of the bread and the wine. Okay, I got to back up for the Johnsons here. Good to see you guys. Um, and so, uh, if you happen to have any questions about our communion practice or the Lutheran understanding of communion, or you have questions or doubts as to whether or not you should receive communion, please give me a phone call. I would love to have that conversation with you during the week. Please put this on your calendars, very important announcement. There will be a special congregational meeting on Sunday, July the 21st, following our morning worship service. You will be receiving information in your mailboxes regarding that meeting, and so please check those out. We will be considering proposals as to the use and the potential sale of our property on 11th Avenue Northwest. Very important. Now, this is an important meeting because, um, and, and perhaps I don't need to remind you of this, but I think it bears saying that the decision as to what to do with the land is not my decision. And it's not our council's decision. It is your decision. According to our Constitution and bylaws, the congregation has to decide what to do with that land. And so that's how important that meeting is on July the 21st. Please put it on your calendars. Well, these are the announcements. I'd like to invite you now to please rise as you are able for our opening hymn and the start of worship proper.
say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Please take a few moments in silence as you bring your prayers of confession before the throne of God's grace. on us and for the sake of his son Jesus Christ and by his blood he forgives us all our sins on this your true confession and in obedience to the Lord's command I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit Bye, bye. 
Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, during his earthly ministry, your son Jesus healed the sick and raised the dead. By the healing medicine of the word and sacraments, pour into our hearts such love toward you that we may live eternally. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated as we continue to worship by the reading and hearing of God's holy word. Our first reading comes to us from the book of Lamentations in the third chapter, verses 22 to 33. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for a man that he bear the yoke in his youth. Let him sit alone in silence when it is laid on him. Let him put his mouth in the dust. There may yet be hope. Let him give his cheek to the one who strikes, and let him be filled with insults. For the Lord will not cast off forever, but though he cause grief, he will have compassion according to the abundance of his steadfast love, for he does not willingly afflict or grieve the children of men. This ends our first reading. We will now read responsively by verse Psalm 30. I will extol you, O Lord, for you have drawn me up and have not let my foes rejoice over me. O Lord, Lord my God, God, I cry to, to you for help. help. And you, you have, have healed, healed me. me. O Lord, you have brought up my soul from Sheol. You restored me to life from among those who go down to the pit. Sing, Sing praises, praises to the Lord, O you his saints, saints, and give thanks to his holy soul. name. For his anger is but for a moment, and his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes with the morning. As, As for me, I said in my prosperity, I shall never be moved. By your favor, O Lord, you made my mountain stand strong. You hid your face. I was dismayed. To you, to you O Lord, I cry. I cry. And to and the to Lord, Lord, I plead for mercy. What profit is there in my death if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it tell of your faithfulness? Hear, Hear O Lord, Lord and, and be, be merciful, merciful to me. O Lord, be, be my helper. You have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have loosed my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness, that, that my glory may sing your praise and not be silent. O oh Lord, Lord my God, I will, I will give, give thanks to you forever. forever. Psalm 30. Our epistle reading is from 2 Corinthians, the eighth chapter, verses one through nine and 13 through 15. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own free will, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints, and this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. Accordingly, we urged Titus that as he had started, so he should complete among you this act of grace. But as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness, and in our love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace also. I say this not as a command, but to prove by the earnestness of others that you love also, your love is also genuine. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. 
I do not mean that others should be eased and you burdened, but that as a matter of fairness, your abundance at the present time should supply their need, so that their abundance may supply your need, that there may be fairness. As it is written, whoever gathered much had nothing left over, and whoever gathered little had no lack. This ends our second reading. Please stand now for the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the fifth chapter. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered about him, and he was beside the sea. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, And seeing him, he fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, so that she may be made well and live. And he went with him, and a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. And there was a woman who had had a discharge of blood for twelve years, and who had suffered much under many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus, and came up behind him in the crowd, and touched his garment. For she said, If I touch even his garments, I will be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease." And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, and fell down before him, and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, Your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house some who said, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. And he allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. They came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and Jesus saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. And when he had entered, he said to them, Why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was, taking her by the hand He said to her, Talitha Kumi, which means, little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking, for she was 12 years of age. And they were immediately overcome with amazement. And he strictly charged them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. This is the gospel of the Lord. may be seated. We'll bring the children forward for the children's sermon. Well, howdy. Hi. Okay. I'm going to give you guys a bag, not, not that one, but this one here. And uh, this is going to be kind of all your bag. I mean, you can, you can think of it as your own. And um, I want you to uh, take a look inside, take a close look, and tell me what you see in there. Trash? Does it look like trash to you? Daniel, you're an analytical type. How do you analyze that? Yeah, he he would say trash. (laughs) Something like from lunch or dinner. Yeah, well, let's see. There's there's this. 
Um, oh, somebody was drinking Gatorade, I guess. Uh, uh, we got a couple of weeds and, um, oh gosh, an old butter container. Um, now let me ask you something a little dangerous. Now, you know, every once in a while, my children's sermons sort of go off the rails. They go a little bit too far. But I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm going to take a risk with you guys. Would anyone like to smell this? <laughs> okay, Isaac, you're on. Give it a whiff. What, what do you smell? Uh-uh, there, there's something in there. Yeah, um, well, there's, there's this bag here. And uh, yeah, that's, that's definitely trash. And it, um, I would say by the look and, and by the smell of it, this is really, really, I mean, it's, it's gone bad already. And there, there's other junk in here. There's a can, there's some, some papers. Okay. Yeah, yeah, you can, don't smell that, Abigail. You're not going to like it. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, all right, so this is definitely trash. And guess what? This belongs to you guys. So there, I'm going to just put it in the middle there. That's your trash now. Um, and uh, whatever you have, like, like uh, um, you're, you're going to probably want to get rid of that because that's not good smelling stuff. It, you know, um, <laughs> that's why we call it trash. On the other hand, we have something in here of value. At least, at, at least it's made to look like it's got a, got a lot of value, Okay. And that is this golden crown, all right? And now, if, if you just pretend that this is real gold, it's not, but just pretend that it is, that's a whole lot different from that bag, isn't it? Would you not say that that's a whole lot different? Just pretend for right now that, that that's genuine. Okay, and so we've got the trash and we've got the gold crown. And uh, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Do you want to get rid of that trash? Yeah, absolutely, you want to get rid of that trash. How about if we make an exchange? Does that sound fair? You get the crown of gold, and I get the trash. What's that? Uh, Elsa says... One man's trash is another man's treasure. <laughs> Not in this case. <laughs> nice try. <laughs> I appreciate your effort there, but <laughs> not in this case. Okay, so there's the crown. Now you guys share in that gold crown. In fact, there's, there's a crown for each and every one of you. Just uh, once again, we're kind of pretending here. Do you know that what we just did in making that exchange is exactly what Jesus has done for us? We come to Jesus with our bag full of sin and our bag full of junk and our bag full of bad habits and our bag full of stuff, which is no better than to be thrown out. And Jesus says, I will take that. I'll take that on myself. All the trash and the mess and the smell, I will take that. And in exchange, you get my righteousness. In other words, what Jesus gives you when we put our faith and trust in him is it's as if we were standing before God, almighty God, and we're clothed in his royal robes, in his righteousness, and crowned with his crown. Now you might say, that doesn't seem like a fair exchange, and you know what, if you were to say that, you're absolutely right. It's not fair. It's grace. And that's why we believe in Jesus, because Jesus on the cross has done something very special for us. He took our trash, and he became sin. Scripture says that. He became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. You think you got that? Okay, good. Let's pray, and I'm going to pray that by the Holy Spirit that that lesson really sticks with you guys, and you're going to pray for the congregation that they get it too. So stand up, close your eyes, put your hands together, bow your heads, and let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, our God, we thank you that you made a tremendous exchange with us, and you took 
on yourself all of our sin and mess and smell and junk. And you gave us a crown of righteousness. We thank you, Lord Jesus. We can't understand that, but by faith we accept it. And I pray, Lord, that our kids would remember that and that all of our people would remember that you made for our sakes a great exchange. We pray it, Lord Jesus, in your most blessed name and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Okay, now, take, no, don't take it with you. I'll just leave it up here. (laughs) All right. And, uh, you know, not only do you get the crown of righteousness, but um, you get candy too. What a deal. So here you go. There you go, Elias. Great, good job. Wow, that really does smell bad. (laughs) Yeah, my wife is going to kill me. (laughs) Well, anyway, the Lord be with you. (laughs) 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 reads this way, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. That's transference, and that's the exchange. And that is our sermon text for today, along with our gospel passage, Mark chapter 5, verses 21 through 43. We are poor. We are poor in God's eyes, but in a gracious exchange, Luther called it a happy exchange, God's spiritual blessings become our spiritual blessings at Christ's expense. Transference, it is the concept that ties our epistle today with our gospel reading. Mark chapter 5 verses 22 through 42 is really two stories that are sandwiched together. Jesus is summoned by Jairus, the synagogue official. And now notice that Jairus, being an important man, is judged rich by his culture. But he humbles himself and becomes spiritually poor. He becomes a beggar when he falls at Jesus' feet and begs him to heal his daughter. The inside of this scripture sandwich is the story of the woman with the discharge of blood. She also is spiritually poor because Leviticus 15 declares that any woman unclean during menstruation is is defiled and unclean until the proper rite of purification. A woman, however, who has been bleeding for 12 years straight can never get clean which makes her an outcast. No one can touch her without becoming defiled. No man could marry her, so there's, of course, no sexual contact there. But worst of all, she's excluded from worship. She is cut off from God because no contact, no transference. And so God cannot become defiled by this woman, so the Jews of Jesus' day thought. And what links these two stories together into one sandwich is a simple concept, 12 years. A 12-year-old girl who's died and a 12-year-old issue of blood. Both are considered unclean, rendering the victim untouchable. The girl has died, and in Jewish culture, there is no greater defilement than to touch a corpse. So both the dead girl and the woman are unclean. According to Jewish law, there should be no touching, no transference of uncleanness, otherwise you too would share in their uncleanness and defilement. Now, a ritually clean person couldn't touch them and make them clean. Rather, the clean person becomes unclean along with the defiled person. 
It always goes one way, not back the other. Now, of course, in the case of death, someone could go through the proper steps and get themselves clean again after handling a corpse. But a woman who was continually bleeding could never really be made clean. Her uncleanness was a problem that just went on and on and on. She'd never get rid of the problem. And you know what that's like, don't you? Never being able to get rid of a problem. There are diseases that go on and on and on. Even though they don't kill you, they weaken you and demoralize you. There are sinful, besetting habits that you just can't seem to shake. There are relational issues that you can't seem to fix. There are perennial money problems that defy resolution. There are life situations that have bled out for 12 years and defy any cure. There are kids who seem, uh, well, they, they seem spiritually alive for a while, let's say up till about the age of 12, and then they just seem to spiritually die without any explanation. There are some who can't shake this feeling that they are unclean and unforgiven, and it goes on and on, disqualified from any divine healing touch. Perhaps some of you know the desperation of looking for a remedy or a cure for your problems, but the empty promises just leave you feeling worse. The woman had suffered much at the hands of many doctors. I mean, she's tried everything probably, and some of the remedies for bleeding in those days were really strange. One was that you could uh, try carrying the ashes of an ostrich egg in a linen rag. Of course, the first problem is you've got to find a cooperative ostrich. Um, But that was one of the remedies in those days, ashes of an ostrich egg in in a clean linen rag. If that didn't work, a woman could try carrying a barley corn taken from the dung of a female donkey. Try that one. Now, we might laugh, but you know what? In 2024, just go online and type in any ailment you want and start looking at some of the strange cures that people are trying nowadays. I'm not kidding about that. Desperation makes people do some strange things, and so it is with this woman. She's tried everything, and she's only gotten worse. But in the midst of her desperation, something else began to happen. She's heard about Jesus. Maybe she's even heard him preach. Maybe she's seen the healing power that he had. And something begins to happen that is quite apart from any human remedy or earthly medicine. Faith is being planted in her. And it is that blessed divine gift of faith that causes this woman to jump every religious and social hurdle and reach out and touch Jesus' garment. She knows you're not supposed to do that, but she jumps every hurdle that she knows and she grasps onto Jesus' garment in desperate hope of healing. And she is healed. Immediately she feels it. Immediately. A transference has occurred. Power has gone out from Jesus, not just power to fix the medical problem, but power to heal the true disease of sin and separation from God. She felt it immediately. But there's more to this idea of transference, in fact, much more. With Jesus, we see the full picture. The the epistle says, we become rich. He takes our poverty. And that's all well and good. And we understand the metaphor. You know, we get the poetry of that line. But this woman's healing is literal. She feels it immediately, and the flow of blood dries up. She becomes aware of that. What happens to the infirmity? What happens to the defilement and the flow of blood? And then we have the 12-year-old girl who is raised back to life. What happens to death? Where does it go? Does all the bad stuff just uh, sort of go away? No, because with Jesus, the transference goes both ways. Matthew 8, 17 
which is a quotation of Isaiah 53, says, He took our diseases and bore our infirmities. And so when our Lord Jesus was crucified, he became sin, became defiled. He bore the woman's illness and ours. His blood flowed instead of hers, and he gave himself over to death and the grave. Isaiah the prophet says it the best. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and by his wounds we are healed. All the defilement of blood and sin and death was transferred to Jesus. It's a happy exchange. And that's why what Jesus offers is radically different from any therapy or self-help project out there. The woman with the hemorrhage did not hit upon some magic principle that could be bottled or sold. The point is this. He who was rich became poor that we might become rich. And how that happens is mysterious. The raising of the little girl is even more clear. You can't get much more helpless than being dead. And the girl is all of us. For the Scripture says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked. Ephesians 2, verse 1. Nothing short of a resurrection, miracle, can make followers of Christ. A lot of you have seen the movie Pirates of the Caribbean. God bless you. Pirates of the Caribbean. Remember uh, the line, the sort of mantra that occurs more than once in that movie? Dead men tell no tales. Dead men also don't respond to God without a miracle. It's impossible. A miracle is needed, and a miracle is always better than a makeover. A miracle is always better than a makeover. And once again, that miracle is the miracle of exchange, of transference. Now, some of you are familiar with another movie, maybe a bit more serious movie than Pirates of the Caribbean. It's called Schindler's List, and that is a true story. In this movie, it is World War II, and Oskar Schindler is a Nazi party member and a self-described profiteer of slave labor. He runs an armaments factory which employs Jews from the local concentration camp. And for reasons not entirely explained in the movie, this morally compromised character, Oskar Schindler, undergoes a transformation of heart. He begins to use his position of authority to try to save as many Jews as possible. And he consistently outfoxes his Nazi superiors and finds ingenious ways of making his factory appear productive when all the while, in fact, it is a model of inefficiency. He risks his own neck as he arranges the escape of Jews whenever he can. And eventually he begins to liquidate his own wealth and possessions to bribe and buy off officials who will look the other way while he's smuggling Jews out of the country. Well, it so happens that the Nazi SS finally comes in with orders to enact the final solution and ship off all the Jews in Schindler's district to the concentration camps. Schindler actually convinces the SS to spare the Jews and to return to their families as men and not murderers. Well, finally Schindler has to go. And so he packs his car in the night, bids farewell to all the Jewish workers, and they give him a letter explaining that he is not a criminal to them, together with a ring secretly made from the workers' gold dental bridge 
and engraved with a quote from the Talmud, a Jewish holy book. Whoever saves one life saves the world. Well, Schindler is touched, but, and, but he's deeply ashamed. He feels he could have done so much more to save many more lives. He could have sold his car or his party badge or some other trinket, if only to save one or two more lives. And he's weeping now. How many more lives could have been saved? Well, that's how Schindler decided to spend his wealth. And what a picture of transference it is. Schindler's wealth was his power, and as with Jesus, power went out from him. His impoverishment meant life for many. We are saved not because we deserve it or can afford it, but because someone else became poor, someone who transferred his wealth to us. We are not healed by our own powers or our insights. We are not raised from the dead because we made the heroic choice to commit our lives to Christ, but because Christ committed himself to us and spoke the word over us and in exchange took all the defilement that was us, all our stench and our garbage, all our disease and death. Because we have been baptized and raised in union with Jesus Christ, his riches are at our disposal. Given the spiritual poverty of this fallen world and the reality of our riches, there's only one reasonable act of service, of worship, that makes any sense for us. And that is for us to agree that power and riches will now go out from us. Riches being transferred, exchanged, if need be. And that is what we have signed on for by being Christ the King, Lutheran Church. So think about what you're doing next week when you come forward for Holy Communion. The riches of heaven will be shared with you then at this altar, around this rail. That's transference. And then... Think another thought. Go one step beyond and think about how to be rich toward your neighbor. To that person in this town, in our context, whether they're a backslidden Lutheran, you know, there's a few thousand of them in this city. I think you might be aware of that. Whether they happen to be a backslidden Lutheran or just a good old-fashioned American pagan who needs to hear the gospel and see your good works so that he or she may glorify your Father in heaven. Think about that person or those persons as you prepare yourself for Holy Communion next week. Don't be reluctant for power to go out from you. Don't fear to loosen your mouths and talk about Jesus. And do not fear when you loosen your pocketbooks in service to your neighbor in need. As our scripture says, do not fear, only believe. Amen. Please stand, and we'll continue to worship by reciting together the standard of our unity and faith as embodied in the Apostles' Creed. Let us join in confessing our faith using these words. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He descended into heaven. Father Almighty, from thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated as we continue to worship by the giving of our tithes and offerings to the Lord. The ushers will keep the plates uh, back in the narthex when we have concluded, concluded the offering.
left alone, my hope is found. He is my life, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, burnt to the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in heaven. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. O Lord, from whom our help comes, you have brought us into your holy Christian church and made Christ our shield from every enemy. Preserve us in such faith until at last you bring us out of this world in the resurrection forevermore. Lord, in your mercy. Holy Father, you have shown to your church the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, who for our sakes became poor that by his poverty we might become rich. Give us generous hearts that our abundance may supply our fellow saints in their need. Let all true preachers of the word serve for the sake of Christ's call, not for earthly gain. And let those who have received excellence in faith, speech, knowledge, and every other gift of God's word provide richly for the preaching of the gospel and the work of the church. Lord, in your mercy, Gracious Lord, your compassion does not willingly afflict or grieve the children of men, but your mercies are new every morning. Bestow your steadfast love on every Christian home. Turn parents in kindness to their children. Make children ready in obedience and love toward their parents and each other. Let the young learn discipline and trust in you, and let fathers not exasperate their children but be devoted to the fear and instruction of the Lord as examples to them. Lord, in your mercy. 
O Lord, you did not turn aside the bold request of Jairus, nor the timid faith of the woman. We implore you, hear our prayers for those in need. Drive away our fears and give us believing faith. Give healing and strength to those dealing with infirmity and any kind of tribulation, especially Don and Diane Munson, Lyle Root, Kay Marie Raymond, Lucy Nelson, Les Wells, Gloria Amundrud, Gregory Easton Jr., Bill Bridget, Clifford Headland, Art Thole, Leona Wenzel, Merle Williamson, Alice Barasa, June Holman, Eileen Wabner, Mike O'Neill, Ron Sieberson Sr., Phyllis Swenson, Leland Root, Ruth Hawker, Dale Loken, our missionaries Fred and Wanda Garcia, and all we now name in our hearts silently. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, may your grace rest also upon the households of Riley Arnhold and Vanessa, Reagan and Colton Barr. Grant them the blessings of good health, joy in their salvation, and the abiding fellowship of your Holy Spirit. Lord, in your mercy. O oh Lord, Heavenly Father, we gratefully remember the sufferings and death of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, for our salvation. Rejoicing in his victorious resurrection from the dead, we draw strength from his ascension before you, where he ever stands for us as our own high priest. Gather us together from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us, for to you alone we give all glory, honor, and worship, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Please rise and let us pray together the prayer that our Lord has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now receive the benediction, the blessing of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. And all God's people said, Amen. Please sing out on our closing hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Thank you.
Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Please.